Thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope that we're all back and welcome back for this afternoon's uh, panels. This panel is, uh, I think the headline panel was, uh, it was described as the FinTech panel, but uh, also a discussion about how innovation is taking place and the velocity of innovation is taking place in, uh, in regulated industries or in, in, in this case, one of our largest in the financial services industry. And uh, joining me on this panel, we have the great pleasure of having uh, Colleen Johnston. And uh, uh, Colleen's title, uh, she's had a, a storied career uh, within TD Bank and has held many of the senior uh, 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 positions there, including as a CFO of the bank, and uh, prior to that had a long career at uh, Scotia, and uh, is, is at the nexus of, uh, of much of what uh, TD Bank is, is doing in the technology and uh, in fintech space. And I think her title is Group Head of Direct Channels, Technology Marketing, and corporate and public affairs. And uh, at, at some stage, I wanted to uh, uh, unpack how all three of those uh, those, those titles uh, are actually relate, whether that's strategic or whether that's uh, uh, it's, uh, just episodic in terms of how the bank is uh, 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 looking at that. And I think that's very interesting. We've also had um, Andrew Graham from Borowell. Many of you know that um, Andrew's a co-founder and CEO of Borowell, which is uh, one of the unicorn uh, uh, and, and star um, I, he's laughing about the unicorn title, but uh, but certainly a star in uh, the, the the fintech startup world, and uh, and Andrew has a, a an enormous pedigree prior to that, and uh, and I think that it's extremely exciting for to have both of these leaders in the sector here. Um, before I, um, I I start, I just wanted to get a show of hands here. Is that how many people here um, use some form of digital banking product, either through their phone or online? Well, it's 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 that's a that's that's I'm sure if we asked that question a few years ago, we would have got a, a, a lot to, less of a response to that. But I think that most of you know that the the fintech revolution is uh, at hand in some ways, and uh, I think that you know globally there's been over 50 billion dollars of uh, fintech uh, investment uh, since 2010, which is an extraordinary number. It's seen as one of the great catalysts for uh, uh, disruptive change uh, in, in the marketplace right now amongst people who follow these. And of course, the, the, con the concept of fintech is, uh, is, you know, it's a bit of a buzzword. There are many uh, sins that get uh, wrapped into that. There's, of course, the consumer revolution that's taking place that everyone knows through their smartphone apps and what's happening with, uh, with, with banking and financial services. There's alternative provision for uh, finance that Andrew's involved in, in terms of other players that are looking at using algorithms and smarter ways of uh, identifying um, uh, what risk is and being able to lend in the margins there. And there's also a significant, I mean, many people have heard of blockchain and maybe these distributed ledger technologies that uh, are taking place in the background um, of banks. And there's an enormous disruptive potential uh, of uh, artificial intelligence and the application of what banks are doing. And of course, the ongoing process changes that are, that are taking place. There's an enormous amount of, of detail in there. And what I wanted to do is maybe um, start with Colleen and just ask her from her perspective. Of course, TD Bank uh, employs 85,000 people and you know, is a, one of the, the largest banks in the world. And uh, how is, is she and her organization thinking about this concept of fintech, what is it doing internally within the organization, and, and where do they see it going in the next uh, uh, five to ten years? Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, you know, as, as you mentioned, I took on this new role starting in January of this year. I've been the CFO of the bank for many years. And uh, coincident with that, it just seemed that the whole uh, media focus on the area of fintech and banks and who was going to win uh, was re reaching a fever pitch and probably is one of the first things that I really started thinking about in the new role um, and the pace of change and how to think about that change and having spent a lot of time thinking about it and I think there's actually been a, a, a perceptible shift in the narrative in, in fact even in a short time in this last 10 months uh, but you know I, I and the notion that you know that fintechs are, are creating this disruption and and causing the banks to change um, I don't think is, is the reality. I think the reality is that banks have been on um, a period, are going through a period of fairly rapid change over many years. And in fact, a lot of it I would link back to the time of the financial crisis. So, you know, really everything changed after the financial crisis. If you think about the global economy, you think about where interest rates are today at unprecedented low levels, you think about regulation, the intensity and the cost of regulation, and at the same time you look at consumer expectations, which are rising really quickly. 
So, you know, we've been on our own journey of significant transformation over many years. That includes um, transforming all of our uh, technologies and moving away from old legacy systems to more modern, flexible, more efficient systems. That You can't do that in a day. It takes some time. Uh, but also building the right business capabilities. You think about things like data and analytics, the workspace and workforce of the future, workplace of the future, all of that's changing. And I think we're actually at a time in our business where we can reinvent our major processes with the customer in the middle of it. So that's all very, very exciting. So when you think about that, um, I, I look at FinTech as really an accelerant uh, for banks that are trying to change themselves, because we have a lot of advantages. I'll start with that. Like clearly, um, and probably the major one is that we have 22 million customers <laughs> on both sides of the border. Uh, we have trust, security, privacy, safety, all of those things are quite fundamental. We have distribution, we understand regulation, we have financial strength. But what do fintechs bring to the table? They bring, they're more lightweight um, in nature, a, a lot less so than a bank. They're more entrepreneurial, uh, they're better innovators. And if you can actually combine the strengths of both organizations, there's obviously a big difference in terms of size, but if you can actually figure out how to get the best out of both organizations, I think it's very, very powerful. And ultimately, the, the, our focus is on saying what's best for the customer. And I think that changes the whole dialogue because my view is that the winner in the digital economy is the customer. And uh, as I say, I think, and we're seeing a lot of good partnerships. We meet with new, fin or new fintechs or startups every single day. Every single day, we want to know what they're thinking, what they're working on. They want, uh, they want to partner with banks in many cases, not all, uh, but they want, to, they want to figure out how to work uh, with banks. And uh, I can give you some examples later of the, the power of leveraging those 22 million customers. It's pretty significant. That's an excellent way to start off. And Andrew, I mean, as, uh, as part of the fintech ecosystem, as part of one of the, 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 the great leaders in, in this space, and uh, certainly one of the most visible, um, how are you seeing the space evolved? And maybe you can uh, walk us through the journey that took you from um, working within an organization to actually starting up an organization, and, and some of the, the the points that you've gone uh, that you've crossed in order to get where you are right now. And you've recently announced a partnership with CIBC, and and maybe you can address this point um, uh, that Colleen had mentioned around partnerships in the ecosystem. Is there a natural tension between big banks and some of this fintech ecosystem? And is that attention a good thing, or are we going to collaborate around the middle? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, uh, a lot there, and thanks for the introduction. Um, you know, maybe where I'll choose to start is uh, just um, sharing how I think about fintech and what it what it means. The uh, World Economic Forum did a great study with Deloitte looking at fintech, and um, I think they came up with a very handy guide for where to look for financial innovation. They said where there's uh, significant established pools of profit and significant customer friction, that's where fintech innovators are going to go. Um, and I think if you look at you know, vertical after vertical, that's been the case, whether it's you know, uh, wealth management for people with, with um, uh, you know, not massive portfolios, if you look at the business that we're in, which is helping people refinance credit card debt, and I can talk more about that, um, you know, th that's where it's happening. Um, the, uh, the reality, and I, maybe just to explain how I see the, 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 you know, the, our current situation in Canada, we should be very proud that we have um, some you know, really excellent established uh, banks, in, in, including um, uh, a TD. I mean, I think we should all be very proud of how our banks did throughout the financial crisis. I, I think we also need to acknowledge, though, that we've got a very concentrated banking system um, and a very profitable banking system. So the Financial Times did a study lining up all the world's banking systems by aggregate profits, so not on a per capita basis, but aggregate, on aggregate profit basis. Canada, with 35 million people, came fourth. So there's more banking profit generated in Canada than in Germany, than in the UK. I mean, it's pretty, it's quite astounding. Um, uh, and part of that is, is uh, it, you know, relates to the point earlier that there are some very profitable niches that I think there's opportunities for companies like ours uh, to go after, or, uh, either alone or indeed in partnership um, uh, with other financial institutions. That's very interesting. I mean, so how, in terms of the uh, profitability challenge, for instance, uh, uh, you know, there's a McKinsey report out that said that uh, in the next 10 years, 60% of retail banking profits are, are going to be under threat as a result of some of the competitors uh, in the underbrush, not the least of which uh, uh, folks like, uh, like Andrew. Um, are banks and are, is the sort of the traditional uh, five, six bank model in this country um, who have traditionally made a lot of money out of retail profits, is that 
fundamentally under threat, does that change the banking system? And the other thing is, is that, uh, you know, as, as many noticed uh, in the last few days, there's been a, a change in uh, mortgage rules, which will push some of the, the risk back onto banks on, in terms of uh, mortgages. And we've already seen some rate rises and whatnot in reaction to that. Is that, do you start, do you see uh, the banks uh, uh, reacting to this, uh, this, this new competitiveness in a, in a different way rather than just uh, looking at uh, uh, raising uh, rates with, with customers? Well, why don't I start? Um, so I, I'm with Andrew. I think the uh, strength of the banks in Canada is a huge source of pride. I think certainly post the crisis, it was an enormous sense of pride for all of us, and uh, the Canadian banks stood tall in the world. And that isn't just about the banks, that's about the health of the Canadian economy, uh, the health of, uh, of our lending processes, you know, you need uh, growth in, in credit capacity to create uh, growth in GDP. So I think the banks have been, uh, have been a great anchor in that process. And I think we do provide lots of choice um, and, uh, and, and obviously different services that are priced different ways to meet the needs of all Canadians. So, and frankly, you know, 45% of our profits go back largely to Canadians, to individual uh, people like you and I. Um, going forward, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think pricing will shift probably, and I think that's um, one of the things that we need to think about is I think that will be um, part of the equation as, um, as we think about new uh, capabilities and fintechs will be part of that. And I think, uh, you know, probably more transparency around pricing uh, will probably drive pricing down to a certain extent. At the same time, though, there, as I mentioned earlier, there's so many opportunities uh, to take existing processes and make them um, so much better um, and, and really putting, again, the customer um, in the center of those processes as we do today but uh, really thinking about um, how you can, uh, you can use digital transformation, digitization and automation in your own organization to drive a much more efficient process, but again, one um, that's easier for the customer and reduces friction. Uh, so I think there are some dynamics that'll shift. At the same time, I think there are some new profit pools that will open up uh, for traditional banks, and, um, and we're exploring all of those opportunities. Things like digital identity um, are areas where the banks are in some ways uniquely positioned to play in that environment. Um, and the key is how do you monetize those, uh, you know, those capabilities. Maybe I could dig a, bit, a little bit deeper onto that one in the sense that, you know, you obviously have a lot of uh, ongoing projects, both on the operations side of the bank that uh, you're exploring in terms of new ways of doing work, uh, potentially the ones that are less labor intensive using use of technology. And on the other side, you're, you're innovating with on the customer side of things. Um, maybe if you could just describe a couple of the projects um, uh, that you're, you're currently working on or uh, that you're, you see as potential opportunities in both of those categories. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we have a large uh, technology transformation program underway. We're into really our third year now. And that isn't about technology for technology's sake. It's about building out business capabilities that will drive competitive advantage for the bank. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of examples, uh, one of which we call omni-channel. Uh, capabilities. So that's really creating a seamless experience for your customer, no matter how they approach us, what channel they approach us through, that it'll, it'll, you'll be able to go seamlessly across all of those channels. So you might start uh, a mortgage application at home on your iPad and then be able to go in and pick it up at a branch or through a call center. Today you tend, uh, and this is really true of most banks, you tend to have uh, individual channel experiences. And a big part of what my team is working on is this broader notion of connection is connecting, better connecting to the customer or client and connecting them to really the vast array of products and services and advice across the organization. Connecting us back to each other and to our communities. You know, that is really a, a, just a core expectation of Canadians today. So that's something we're focused on is, is the omni-channel uh, experience. Data and analytics would be another area where we're spending a lot of uh, time and thought. Again, our, our customers, we know a lot about our customers and our customers want um, us to be able to um, treat them in a way that shows that we understand that, be able to anticipate their needs, increase the IQ of our organization to again create that better and better customer experience. But for us, and I think everyone knows TD's uh, calling card is the customer, and our customer centricity has been something that's always set us apart. So we keep the customer in the center of everything we think about. Then there's lots of infrastructure things that we work on really to think about how do you get to market more quickly? Because again, uh, you know, the word agility wasn't uh, used in banking five years ago. Uh, today, it's, uh, in, you know, we include it in every uh, second sentence. Uh, so, you know, how do you get to market quicker and how do you do it in a way that's, that's more efficient? So cloud computing, um, there's a whole bunch of things that we're doing just on our basic infrastructure to make us better run. And the, the name of the game, it frankly, is then to free up 
um, some of those dollars to reinvest in changing the bank and do that at pace. So that is the imperative for established players today, is to be, how do you, how do you be more nimble and agile, uh, which is, uh, again, not normally part of our DNA. So uh, that's where you're seeing a lot of change uh, in traditional organizations. I'm gonna come back to that nimble and agile and how, you know, as uh, my uh, good friend uh, Vijay Vethiswaran, the economist calls, how you get dinosaurs to dance. And uh, that's one of the key uh, tasks, I think, in this, this new economy. But I, 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 going to uh, bring Andrew into the conversation just around this idea of uh, where are the, the, the new sweet spots that are being opened up for startups that you see, um, given the amount of change that's taking place with the banks, either partner with the banks, but also, I mean, there's a lot of space being exited by the banks. The digital uh, disruption is uh, creating new expectations to be out of the customer. On one side, are there are there granular opportunities that you see, particularly for Canadian startups? And maybe if, just to expand that a little bit, um, um, also maybe reference some global uh, uh, examples that you might see as well. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the reality is I think there's so many different models being tried now. There's a great image that you can, you can Google. It, it has Wells Fargo homepage on it, and it has arrows with logos of startups that sort of pointing at every single part of the homepage. These are sort of like, if there's an insurance part of the homepage, there are like 15 different startups attacking insurance. If this is the part of the homepage about loans, here are 30 different startups you know, going after loans. So I think the reality is really, that we're at a time of really explosive growth in the number of new models, and companies like ours around the world are trying a whole lot of different things. Um, I think if you look at the, you know, the, the major functions that, that, uh, that banks serve today in terms of you know, matching capital and making transactions, um, uh, you know, lending is the space I'm in. Both lending to consumers is uh, changing. There's, there's, you know, a lot of different models, uh, both in, you know, in, in Canada, but obviously beyond as well. Billions and billions and billions of dollars of consumer lending uh, being done by by new players, players like us. Uh, small business lending, which in certain parts of small business lending in certain parts of the world has been exited by by some banks. I mean, that's a broad broad area and a broad statement, but small business lending has been uh, an area of real focus. Um, you know, transactions are increasingly an area of focus. We've talked a lot about, about sort of fintech and, you know, should uh, banks be scared of, you know, companies like ours uh, and, you know, you can come to whatever judgment you, you, you know, you, you want to. I think they definitely should be scared of Google and Facebook um, and Apple who are increasingly playing in the uh, financial services space. So Apple Pay today runs on, you know, Visa, Mastercard, Rails. I mean, you need a, a um, you know, you need a card. But does that have to be the case tomorrow or in ten years? And what does that mean if you're a bank trying to compete with Apple or or Facebook or Google? I think that becomes a more daunting uh, thing to think about. I, I would imagine. So you know, so I've talked about lending, uh, transactions, and then certainly you know, asset management and asset growth. We're seeing the growth of of companies, uh, you know, robo advisors, people in Canada like Wealth Simple or Nest, who are uh, allowing individuals to invest in a very, very, uh, very inexpensively in ETF-like vehicles. So, again, going back to the sort of the, the World Economic Forum line, wherever you see pools of profit, companies are there going after it, trying to say, "Hey, look, here's a different solution." And you know, not uh, clearly, not all of them. You know, many, the most of them aren't going to succeed, but some will. And uh, that's exactly as I agree 100% with Colleen. That's really for the benefit, ultimately, of, of customers, consumers, and small businesses. Can I give an example, maybe a partnership example um, in TD that I think has been a huge success and sort of illustrates the story? So uh, we have a, an exclusive arrangement with a company called Movin. And Movin had started out, the founder had started out about five years ago as being a bank disruptor and down with banks, we're going to break the banks. And in fact, in 2013, um, uh, Movin was the, um, the best in class winner at Finnovate, um, the, big, uh, the, the big show and that was in London that year. Um, so, um, and, and, um, and Movin started their own direct-to-consumer model in the United States, which of course in some ways is the prize market, um, and, started, um, and, and started offering, um, and what, what this is is a personal financial management tool um, that helps you manage your finances in real time. So in the meantime, Movin uh, came to, an, we did an exclusive partnership in Canada, and, um, and, we, um, and you would see the app, it's called TD MySpend. And so what this does actually is goes into all of your own payments history and populates uh, information about how you're spending. So it isn't like you have to go and put together a spreadsheet and say I spend X amount on rent and X amount on groceries. It actually pulls this together for you and helps you. And then you set goals 
um, in terms of how you want to spend by category. But even better than that, my daughter hates this, but it actually gives you alerts in real time <laughs> if things are, if you're actually spending money outside of your goals. Um, so in fact, what we do know, and we have empirical evidence to say that it actually is changing the spending habits of some of our customers and they are saving more. Um, and we see that statistically. So here's the interesting part of this. So again, remember 40,000 direct-to-consumer accounts in the United States. As of now, we've had over 700,000 downloads of uh, TD MySpend in Canada. And uh, for a period of time back in May, this was the number one rated free app in Canada above chat, uh, Snapchat, Instagram. It's a fantastic experience and our customers love it. So it really does tell you, it's back to that, this is where having 22 million customers that trust us and, and like this functionality, it's the power of that partnership. So I would say Movin are now thrilled uh, to be partnering. Uh, you know, we work hard uh, to be a good partner. Um, we have a culture that's attractive, I believe, to, um, to other organizations, and it's a real win-win here. Um, and we have many other examples uh, like that. And again, not every FinTech is gonna say, hey, I wanna be TD's partner. Um, but, uh, but there's a lot of power now in their model, and that 700,000 accounts is going to continue to grow. That's a terrific example. I mean, I've downloaded that. It's a fairly frightening app in some ways, but, uh, um, I, but, but certainly has Are behavioral... Are you saving more? Yeah, no, exactly. So it, the, it certainly has some behavioral nudge uh, capability to that, and I think that's quite interesting. And so, but I want to get back to a point that uh, Andrew made about um, some of the large players in this space. I mean, I think that we're right now, you know, we tend to bounder this discussion by talking about big banks and small fintechs, but the reality is, is that we're living increasingly in a world of platforms and uh, global megalithic platforms that are enormous and have huge capacity both in terms of AI in terms of knowing the customer we haven't even talked about you know in the world of virtual reality uh, you know post this we, the amount of data points that large platforms are going to have on you and also in your financial behaviors is extraordinary and do you see in in the midst of that there will be a, a, a number of platforms that do succeed and potentially that could be called a Facebook or a Google and, but Facebook and Google are very directly involved in uh, taking over the customer as is their intent and, uh, and, and being and disintermediating banks in many ways. And you're starting to see that intent across different platforms. And I'll give you one example of, of that, that I've seen recently is that uh, anyone who's been to China in the last six months will, will, can't have avoided being on WeChat at some stage. And WeChat is LinkedIn, PayPal, Facebook, your banking app, it's used for everything. There's 700 million users of this. And this is a app that virtually didn't exist five years ago. And so all of a sudden we've seen in one of the great economies of scale, uh, this app sort of grow to that size. We see the intent of uh, some of the large players uh, and, and rightfully uh, potentially um, in the United States. How do you see that global platformization sort of affecting what banks, and particularly chartered banks in Canada, are thinking about this? Are you thinking about this? Are you partnering? Are you, how are you, you, you looking at that world? Yeah, so I think you have to stay in touch with everything that's going out there in the, on in the, in the broader ecosystem. You absolutely do. Um, and, you know, things like Apple Pay, we, you know, the Canadian banks offer Apple Pay, and our, our customers like it. They also like our own payment capabilities. They, you know, for a lot of customers, well, it's just as easy for me to tap. You know, I don't necessarily need to use Apple Pay. So, but again, you're providing uh, Canadians with choice, I think is important. But for example, TD was the first bank in the world to be on Facebook Messenger. Um, and you know, you have to continue to experiment and see how that develops. But you know, you do get to stages in that process, and we're going through all of this right now, is where you know, authentication is really important. Like we don't necessarily want our customers to give us information about their accounts or about their transactions because of the authentication issues. So how do you ensure, because at the end of the day, people expect a bank. When you're dealing with TD, you know, you expect everything to be very trustworthy and safe and secure. We, you know, frankly, customers hold us to a higher standard, and we do have to adhere to that. But, you know, what we do is we work very actively with, um, internally, with all of our control partners and our risk partners uh, to make sure we've got the right people at the table at the right time and that we can accelerate some of um, these discussions as opposed to saying, well, that, look, if there's an authentication challenge, forget about it. Um, we're, not gonna, uh, we're not gonna do it, it's not safe. Um, and, you know, and, and have dialogue with, dialogues with regulators and again, internally, how do, we, uh, uh, how do we advance a number of proof of concepts quite rapidly with the right people at the table? Because you know, at the end of the day, it is about consumer protection. 
It is about the safety of the financial system. You know, we can talk about Amazon all day long, but you know, hey, if your book didn't arrive, <laughs> uh, you know, it isn't the end of the world. This is people's money. This is their life. Um, and it's, so it's very, very important. So all to say that we have to stay in that space, uh, but, uh, but do it, um, you know, very responsibly. I'm going to come back to, to, to Andrew and, and ask a question of Andrew in terms of these global competitors and what you're seeing because, I mean, clearly, you know, we have this regulated environment when our, our conversations in Canada are, are largely confined to Canada for some reason. And, but the global space is moving very quickly. There are a lot of interesting developments in the United States, but most importantly in Asia. Asia is where is driving the, the, the sort of fintech global uh, uh, coalface right now. And uh, are, are, for instance, with Borrowell, are, are your ambitions to be a great Canadian company or is it to also be a global company? Is that, it, in, or is that a legitimate aspiration for Canadian fintech startups right now? I mean, I, I think it's absolutely the way that every, every Canadian startup, you know, to make a broad statement, everyone should be thinking about how, do, how can we go abroad. It's something we think about a lot. You know, fintech is an industry where the uh, barriers to going between markets is higher than, than, than other uh, industries because of regulation. So you see fewer examples of global or even, you know, transnational fintech players than you might in other industries. I mean, I talked about sort of consumer lenders and others. Um, you know, there are no U.S. consumer lenders in Canada today. There are, there's, I guess, one uh, that I can think of, small business uh, U.S. consumer lender in Canada today. It's just hard, you know, regulation matters, and it's harder to go across borders. Now, that said, we view Canada, for us, as a great beachhead market um, because, uh, you know, th for a few reasons. First of all, you know, it is a concentrated banking system, so there are just fewer choices for consumers, so we can be another choice. Um, there is a lot of, you know, sort of profit in the system uh, so that we think we think that gives us a chance to go after it. And, you know, there's a history of uh, Canadians uh, being willing to try new new brands in financial services. It's not to say it's easy, but you think of the success that ING Direct had in Canada. You think of the success that PC Financial, uh, where I used to work, uh, ha has had in Canada. I mean, there is a track record of, um, you know, non-big six brands doing well in financial services. And you know we we view our approach, uh, you know, uh, as being one that can be sort of honed and ultimately grown here in Canada before we look before we then go abroad. So absolutely, we want to go abroad. It's um, you know it's not something we're going to do in the next uh, in the next six months, but it's absolutely on our radar. Uh, if I can make one other point, I mean I, we, we've talked a bit about the the challenges coming to established financial services, and I mean really I guess all of us in the financial services space from the Googles and Apples of the world. I think the other reality in financial services today is that you have non-financial services players making huge impact in financial services almost you know, accidentally or at least blindly. So let, to give two examples, you know, imagine you run a car insurance business today, okay? This has got to be a pretty crazy, maybe scary time to run a car insurance business. What does it mean for your business if there, no, you know, there, it's only driverless cars in 10 years? I mean, you have to totally rethink how you do car insurance. That wasn't an innovation that came from the financial services space. To give a second example, who's ever heard of a company called 23andMe? Is that a company some people have heard of? So 23andMe, what you do is you, or you, you for $100, you order online, they send you a kit, and you take a swab of your cheek, you know, inside your cheek, and you put it in a little vial, and you send it back, and they, um, and I may butcher the language here if they're, you know, scientists, but they sort of sequence or, or, or do some sort of sequencing of your DNA to understand, um, your likelihood, uh, well, they tell you a few things. They tell you about culturally where are you from in the world, where, where, you know, what uh, geographically, where do your ancestors come from. But more interestingly, they tell you your likelihood of getting different diseases. So di certain diseases have genetic markers that mean you're much more predisposed to get those diseases than someone who doesn't have that marker. So what does that mean for the life insurance or the health insurance industry that that kind of testing is readily available? Because if I'm a consumer and I find that I'm m much more likely to get a certain disease, is that going to change how I think about insurance and then disrupt insurance pools? So, you know, that was not, it, it is not a financial services business, but it's creating real waves in the financial services world. And I, I think examples like that are just going to keep proliferating and cause real challenges and create real opportunities for those of us in the financial services space. That's fascinating. I, mean, I think that there's this issue of cross-pollination and the, uh, the change in business models accidentally, I think, is a, is a really important one. And maybe from a, uh, an established bank point of view, I mean, that's, it'd be interesting, Colleen, to get your perspective in terms of where you're starting to see all of these, these, these uh, side plays starting to affect your, your real business. Yeah, I mean, we, we think it's exciting. 
frankly. Uh, you know, if you, we, you can learn from these uh, companies as, as we're learning from you. I mean, I think, you know, again, we go back to this notion of disruption. I think the imperative for established pay players is to, is to disrupt themselves. I mean, what you're doing, Andrew, is really you're creating, you're taking processes that currently take too long. Uh, for customers, you know, to, to get approvals and to get funded, and you're, you're delivering a better experience. So I think it behooves us as the established players to say, hey, how do you remove that friction for your own customers and get better and faster at these things? But, you know, the insurance side is, is a great example. Uh, we do have a property and casualty business. We do have auto insurance. And uh, we're completely transforming that business, every aspect, aspect of it, the claims experience. We're going now into usage-based uh, insurance where we actually judge people's, <laughs> yeah, you, you can, uh, through your mobile device, we actually judge your driving skills and give you ratings and there's gamification involved in this. We actually give you driving tips. We're just rolling this right out, out, out now um, in the next couple months. It's called TD My Advantage. And, um, and you'll get discounts on your, uh, on your insurance, um, you know, if you have a good uh, driving record or a good driving behavior. Uh, so things like that. So why is that good for us? It's because our customer will keep engaging with us. Like if we look on the digital side of the world, the number of times a day um, that our customers engage with us is enormous. It's huge. I mean, there's lots of people who check their balance 10 times a day. <laughs> I mean, so anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's very, very interesting. Like we have, uh, again, another, um, this is a, another collaboration. Uh, this was a, um, a, a company that was born out of the DMZ in Toronto, Flybits. And it's, uh, we, we market it under the brand of TD for me. Uh, so what this is is a digital concierge that provides you with curated content uh, that's relevant to you based on your geolocation. So when you're out, let's say you walk into a builder uh, sales center um, in town, uh, we know where you are. Now you've consented to this. You know, we're not trying to creep you out or anything. You've, con you've consented to be, to be part of the service and we say hi. Um, you're at so-and-so's uh, site, you know, would you like the floor plans? Um, would you like any other information? By the way, if you'd like to speak to a mortgage specialist, uh, we'd be happy to refer you to someone. You know, we are actually experimenting with the capabilities that allow us, based on publicly available information, like what you've got on Facebook, to know your interests and link you up with someone at TD um, that has the same interests. So, I mean, the power of technology now is absolutely enormous if you think about that experience. But so why does our customer then, um, and we're constantly, so they, you know, they may be in an area where we say, hey, we know you love music. Well, TD's a sponsor of a, a concert today at Echo Beach. Uh, you know, here's two free tickets. Uh, so we're engaging with our customers in a way that's relevant uh, for them. And again, it keeps them fully engaged with us, which is our goal. I took away from that, TD is going to give you driving tips very soon. Um, but uh, I, no, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And, and from a actually getting the organizational agility up to make these changes, I mean, these are fascinating changes. They're happening at a very uh, a fast clip. Um, but all that we know about organizations are that, you know, it, they are very difficult to move in the short term. Can you tell us a little bit of the challenging side, you know, between us on the stage and a few people in the audience and maybe television audiences, who knows, um, who may be hearing about this. But uh, can you share a couple of your experiences about maybe some of the challenges and what you're actually trying to do to get that organization to move? Yeah, so I, I think this is probably one of the biggest areas of challenge for um, established players is, um, you know, we are very process driven. Uh, there's a lot of checks and balances, as there should be. As I've said earlier, that's what our customers and what Canadians expect from us. But how do you make sure that you can make the decisions in the right way but do it faster? So, for example, we have labs. Uh, we have, uh, we're part of the uh, Communitech uh, community. Uh, we've got a lab there, and we do two things there. Um, part of it is really about expressing the possibilities, and it's really amazingly cool. You have these uh, typically Waterloo students uh, who are part of our, either on co-op or full-time, uh, ultimately full-time, that come in and they do these presentations. They're given a business problem. They can proto prototype something in four days. Um, and turn it around, they're all articulate, creative, it's amazing. So they are actually helping us really, really advance our capabilities. This is small in the context of TD overall. But the other thing they do is they host various groups from TD um, to really help understand, you know, what, is, uh, what does it feel like to incubate? What is the, how, do you, how do you work on ideation? How do you be faster? And then I think, frankly, you have to really break down your core processes within an organization, as we do, and how do you make them faster? So, like, for example, I mentioned the proof of concept notion. Uh, we have a process whereby, and you can't, you can't have everybody in a tailspin every single day. Hey, I just met with Andrew. We want to turn this around 24 hours from now. 
But on the other hand, how do you take a limited number of these things and get all the right people to the table very quickly uh, so that you can accelerate decision making? And we've got actually a very well-developed protocol around that because we want to also be seen as an organization that's inviting uh, to fintechs. Um, as opposed to, gosh, if I get into bed with TD, it's going to take me forever and a day to get my answer or get my funding or otherwise. Like I was in a meeting at, of our innovation council a few weeks ago, and uh, we were looking at a, at a startup idea, and we were 18 weeks into the process. And I said, 18 weeks is too long. That's just too long. Now, that wasn't to make the final decision and, and, and seal the deal. Um, but again, if you take it from the context of, of a fintech, uh, we've got to move faster. So we are looking at all of our, our processes, our, the way we make decisions, and again, responsibly um, a, a adapting them uh, to the new environment. Good. I want to ask a question to Andrew. We're going through right now a, a, a discussion, an ongoing discussion with the government um, around the innovation agenda. And it's part of that is about you know, accelerating the pace uh, of our, and our startup community and also not just that, but also to get to the commercialization gap. And Andrew, you're well familiar with this. Um, if you were to put as a, as a CEO of a startup, somebody who's been successful in this space and who's seen a lot of this action right now, if you were to say there are a couple of things that this government could do that would really uh, pour some jet fuel onto our space, what, what would that be? Like, what would a couple of those things be? You know, I, I think the first thing is to acknowledge that you know, I believe there's a problem uh, in terms of financial services, uh, you know, startup innovation or innovation in Canada. And my evidence for that is, I mean, if you look at, um, you know, number of deals, deal size, number of companies, employment by companies, you know, we're below where we should be on a, on a, on a fair share basis with, with places like London or New York. So I, I, first of all, I think there's a, there's a challenge. I think, you know, if you're a pol I mean, part of that, look, it's on entrepreneurs like myself to build, you know, more companies, bigger companies. But, it's, but there's also, I think, some public policy challenges around, um, you know, why aren't there more, uh, why isn't the ecosystem bigger? And by the way, I think having a bigger startup, startup ecosystem, and it sounds like I'm, my guess is that Colleen would agree, is that that's good not only for consumers, it's also good for our established players. So a healthy financial services ecosystem is one, one that has large players, but also small players. Why is there a sort of a, a shortage of small players? Well, I think one of the reasons is, and, and this is painting, um, a large number of financial regulators in Canada with a broad brush, um, uh, but with that caveat, th there tends to be more of a focus on stability and security than on innovation. So I've yet to meet a financial services regulator in Canada who says, I have explicit goals around innovation, around making sure that there's you know, pathways for new companies. We're starting to see it. I really want to sort of applaud the OSC for their new launch pad, which is a, a, a way for emerging companies to engage with them. Um, and uh, you know, tr essentially try out new new models at uh, at small scale. I think things like that are great. I think we need um, you know more of them, and we're behind a little bit. Uh, you know, there's also some really simple things we can do. There's a there's a a, a, a rule in the UK that I think is um, very interesting. That if a big bank turns down a small business loan applicant, if they choose to do that. That's of course their decision. They then have to refer them to a list of non-traditional fintech type small business lenders. So. You know, that's kind of an interesting way to promote some additional competition if you're turning down um, established clients. So I think we, we need to look at financial services regulation, of course, through the important lens of stability, but also through a lens of, you know, are we doing everything we can to create more innovation in this space? Colleen, just going back to you on this, are, are we too cozy in this country? We have five, six banks, and we've, uh, we, in a way, have made a virtue out of the, the security of our banking system and the uh, the relative stability of our banking system, but is this a moment where actually that thing that got us to where we are right now is is the thing that's going to hold us back in developing a really innovative undergrowth of, uh, of, of businesses that will then take us to the next place? Well, well let me start by saying I, I agree with Andrew that I think we should welcome uh, more innovation, uh, more startups, more talent to Canada, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but I think the current system works incredibly well and gives lots of choice uh, to Canadians, I think there's been actually less disruption in Canada because the Canadian system really works well and I think we should be proud of that as Canadians. You know, one of the things that the U.S. is trying to solve for now, and again, disruptors have been helping <laughs> to solve for this, is P2P, so peer-to-peer -peer payments. Um, and we've had uh, P2P in Canada for 10 years through Interac. I mean, that is, and, and, and it's just getting better and better and payments have been faster. Um, you know, we have a less fragmented banking system. So there are lot, lots of advantages to the Canadian system. That's not to say, hey, let's be complacent. 
uh, everything's working great, it can always be better. But you know, our, our motto is this, our customers don't want disruption. They're not saying, hey, can you disrupt me uh, and change everything for me? They want us to guide them you know, to their future with simplicity, with good solutions, value for money. That's what Canadians really want uh, from their banks. And we find actually the key is not just developing new gadgets and new uh, tools, it's actually creating that adoption uh, for Canadians. Like I'll give you one example. Uh, mobile uh, uh, mobile re uh, remote deposit capture um, is where you, you know, with your tablet, you know, you take a picture of that physical check and it goes into your account. This is the best thing since sliced bread, honestly. I don't know if any, how many of you use it. It really, really is. You don't have to go to an ATM. You don't have to go to a physical branch. You can do it. You have the security. You've got a, a picture of the front and the back of the check. So if anybody feels, geez, I've lost that check forever, I'll never see it again. Yet the adoption is a lot lower than you would think. So the name of the game for banks is to um, actually not, as they say, constantly change and have new releases of things every few months. It's to say, how do we actually show this capability to more and more of our customers, help them learn how to use it, um, phone our phone channel. Our, our, you know, we, uh, we have uh, many, many, we have 8,000 people in our call centers in North America. Ask for help in terms of how you get set up on these things so you can actually start uh, leveraging some of the basic capabilities that are there now to make your life better. I mean, we, the way we look at it is, you know, you don't get up in the morning and say, I want to get a mortgage or, or I want to uh, get a new visa card. Uh, you say, you know, I want to live my life. I want to own a home. I want to take a vacation. I want to start a business. I want to have a great retirement. You know, we, we're helping customers live their lives. So that's how I think about it. But back to your more fundamental question. I think there's, uh, and Ed Clark did a great speech on this, uh, by the way, a couple of weeks ago at the Canadian Club, and he was talking about the future and the prosperity of Ontario. And he really talked about the fact that we've got to become an innovation hub um, and, a, and a, a technology hub globally. And we need to focus, there's lots of things, and it isn't just about um, talent um, and people, uh, that's, that's you know, part of the equation, but how do we make sure, even from an infrastructure standpoint, and this is clearly on the federal government's agenda, is how do we improve our infrastructure to make uh, Canada a desirable place to live, our cities more livable, transportation, make sure it works, how do you make sure there's the right amount of capital? You know, I think today uh, the, f the startup space, um, uh, incubator space has probably more money than the accelerator space, and we need to make sure companies can actually bridge between startup and, and greater maturity. Uh, so, um, and again, the talent imperative, I think, is there. So I, I think there's definitely more we need to do. But um, as Ed said, and, I, and, and again, I'm not trying to get into a political discussion here, but as he said, you know, as the economy changes, we can't uh, be afraid of technology because it is really the future of where the world is heading, but we can't at the same time leave people behind because that's what's really creating uh, without getting into a big speech, a lot of the unrest and populism that we're seeing uh, globally, um, and in fra fact, we're seeing south of the border as well, that you know, we have to figure out how we're going to transition uh, to this new world, but in a way that, as I say, doesn't leave people behind. Uh, if anybody um, you know, has a chance to, to listen to the speech or get the speech, I thought it was just excellent. That's terrific. And I, I, I'm noticing time is short, but I mean, one of the, the questions I will end on, I think that uh, uh, the audience might be interested in this, is that if, you know, maybe if both of you could reflect on you know, who your biggest competitors are right now, given all of that we've, dis we've, we've described, and how do you see that changing in five to ten years' time? And what space are you going to be in? And, um, and just to tack on, I'm going to smuggle in a question that uh, we never really got to, but, but there's a tremendous amount of interest right now in the Canadian banking space and the fintech space from global investors and thinking about the Alipays and, and others that are really looking at our, our sector to say, you know, maybe this is an opportunity for us to get involved. And, and should we be opening the door to that competition or how should we be handling that competition? So I've smuggled two questions into one, but I, you know, you guys are experts. So I'll maybe start with Andrew. You know, I think our, um, uh, the, 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 the biggest comp competitor we have is sort of for share, um, is I would say sort of, in, you know, incumbent systems. So what I didn't, I'm not sure I didn't talk that much about our company. The, the main thing we do is we help consumers with credit card debt refinance credit card debt. And there are many people with great credit histories making, you know, have, who have good jobs who carry credit card debt because we know that many, many Canadians live paycheck to paycheck and stuff happens. So we help people take 20% credit card debt and, and get a loan that's much, much cheaper. And for us, the biggest challenge is how can we, you know, get the word out and help Canadians know that we exist, that this option exists. Um, so in fact, any of you who want to promote FinTech as a result of this, uh, even if you don't want a loan, I would invite you to come to our website. You can get your credit score for free with us. We were the first company in Canada to do that at large scale. So if you don't know your credit score, 
I'd invite you to come and, and, and get it with us. I, I may be slightly less um, uh, optimistic or slightly less content uh, versus Colleen on the question of how we're doing in Canada. I mean, remote check capture has been, you know, um, been available for what? I mean, 10 years plus in the, U in, in the US and other markets. I, I think we've got a, I probably would respectfully disagree about where we sit versus other, you know, other nations in terms of rolling out uh, that kind of technology to consumers. But I mean, I guess to sort of to, to, to answer your question, um, you know, wh what, what we worry about is can we get people to try our, our product and, and give us Mindshare? So if we look at our business, uh, you know, yes, we're a bank, but we have many, many, many businesses within that bank, you know, whether in the retail space, the commercial business banking, insurance, wealth, uh, you know, we have our U.S. bank as well, we have our wholesale business. So uh, there isn't one standard answer to sort of say who's the, you know, the, who is the scariest competitor of the future, where are things evolving. I think it'll, it actually may vary uh, depending on what business you're looking at, but I think you have to think about uh, all your competitors, and I, I think that's the reality. Uh, to the point we, we talked about earlier, I think, yes, you're going to see fintech uh, creating an impetus for change. We have to, again, disrupt ourselves. Uh, but I think uh, you're going uh, you're to also see other non-traditional players come in um, who are going to who are going to enter the payment space one way or the other. So I think the name of the game is to be uh, you know great at what you do, uh, keep the customer uh, as, as your key focus, and and deliver value to your customers. And um, and I think that is uh, that is the future. But it is uh, it is it is going to change rapidly. And I, I think that is the world we're living in. I think as as much as I look at our bank and how much we've adapted, I could I could take I could step you through the last number of decades and and the, the enormous amount of change that's gone on and how the consumer has benefited from that, I think it's accelerating. I think it's the reality. If you actually look at what Google thinks, Google thinks there'll be more change in the next five years than there's been in the last hundred. Uh, so I think the imperative is there. I, I think, you know, the, um, while, while FinTech is, is, um, is definitely, um, you know, is a, a challenger model for banks, I think the, probably the greater challenge for us is that established players are copying FinTech ideas, um, and, and the, more, um, the more established pay players can be uh, nimble and more lightweight and more innovative, I think that, too, is going to up the bar for everybody. So I think there's lots, uh, lots to think about. On that note, thank you very much to both panelists. This has been a terrific panel. I think it's given us a lot of uh, pause for thought, and I think it's given give us some optimism and uh, some points of departure for, for further conversation. So uh, we'll leave it at that, and uh, maybe a round of applause for our two panelists. Thank you. Thank you.